All right, so uh, you should have then your uh, project folder for the day. I've already made a copy of my work from last time, and um, it's just the, the last 621 folder, and I copied it to 628. So it's just a copy of the work from last time. I'm going to open that up, and uh, I'll open both the index and the JavaScript. Now, one thing that you can do with Notepad++, actually, to save a little bit of time, is if you select both or all of your files, you can open them all at once uh, by clicking one to select and then uh, control clicking the other one. Then if you right click, you can edit both of them at once, or you can open them both quickly with Notepad++. So instead of opening one, then open the other, you can select both at once and then edit with Notepad++ and you've got them both open. All right, so I've got both my index open and my JavaScript file open. I'm going to run this in the browser just to remind myself what it looks like. And you should be switching over to the developer's console right away because now that we're going to deal with much more uh, JavaScript, we want to make sure that it's behaving how we expect. So all that I see so far in the developer's console, F12, ready to rock. Uh, line 7 in my JavaScript file. So whatever it says here, this is going to be also very important for us as we do debugging. This is telling you in which file there is some output or an error. And then it often tells you what line number and even what column. So here it's saying uh, in the myjavascript.js file line 7, column 2, this appears. And the columns is exactly what it sounds. You know, two spaces over, this is where this command was found. Seven lines down, this is where that was found. So you're also able to click. Uh, I'm, in Chrome, I'm in Firefox. It's probably similar in, in Chrome. I'll check it in a moment. But you're able to click the file also. And it'll open up in the developer's console. It might be a little compact. Uh, but it can also open up. Uh, as a preview of your various um, files there. Here it is in my case, line 7, uh, column 2. There is one, two spaces over. We've got that command. So that's just there to show you that as we get more complex and we get error messages and you see some feedback here, this is not just random numbers. This is telling you at line 7, column 2, this is something that happened. In my case, a console log output. And in other instances, it could be an error to help you track it down. So let's see. At this point, what we've got is the uh, login screen, a uh, cool looking login screen that doesn't do anything yet. And if you try to fill it in, a at a.com with password a and click go. Uh, in Firefox, I get a parsing error. In Chrome, you probably get a different kind of error. That's normal. The login is not working yet. OK, we're working on sign up. If I go into sign up, I'll create a brand new account. Uh, a or B at B.com with password B, confirming B, join. Um, that's not quite working there, but where we last left it was, our function for signing up is running. And in my case, it says line 31, column 3. That's where I've got that console output. Um, we have detected what the person typed into the boxes. Your email is whatever, your password is whatever, and your confirmed password is whatever. And again, line 41, 42, and 43 in my case. That's where we last left it. So we're going to capture this input. We're going to create an account. Um, store their password and all of that and then a system to verify who are you what's your password come on in or if I don't know who you are create an account or if your password is incorrect deal with that although that's gonna happen in the JavaScript so let's go over to our JavaScript file let's see so line 43 
do a couple of notes up here what we did last time uh, right before the start of that of those variables um, create js objects representing HTML nodes. We're going to do that several times. We'll create a JavaScript object of an HTML node. It knows which node because of the unique ID. And remember here, especially as a beginner, uh, I've seen this uh, several errors already, and that's OK. But I'm going to see it several more times, and that'll be OK to a certain point. Eventually, you're going to need to be careful here. I saw several people forgetting to put the pound sign on that. The pound sign, of course, means this is an ID. If you don't put the pound sign, it'll try to look for an element named in email signup. Not, not an ID, not a class. It'll try to look for a tag. Technically, it'll try to look for a tag called in email signup. A tag like the P tag or the A tag without any uh, special character ahead of it. It thinks it's a tag. So it wouldn't necessarily be an error. It's a logic error, but not a syntax error. And we're going to run into those, and those are very frustrating. We're going to have syntax errors versus logic errors. Syntax errors is that I misspelled var to be var. There's no such thing as var, so that's a syntax error. That's just wrong JavaScript. Logic errors are much more complex. This is a syntax error. I didn't type my code wrong at all. I used the code properly. Var is proper. The uh, assignment operator is correct. The jQuery selector is correct. The logic error is I'm trying to select an element that is, um, again, that is um, a tag, not, a, uh, not an ID. So let me take that back. OK, so. Um, we created a JavaScript representation of the whole node, uh, that whole input box. And then over here, we're saying, let's output what the person typed into the email box, specifically the value. We'll do a quick note right here on that line. All right, one more note right here, line 42. Using val jQuery method, we can read or write the value of an input box. I just wanted to note it here, obviously, because we will use it again later. Um, this represents the whole box. And technically, properties such as what was the size of the box, what was the color of the box, what was the font, what was its position, its x and y values. So doing this, this represents the whole box on screen. We have to then specify, give me only the value of what's in the box. And we have other ways to manipulate it as well. Off the top of my head, I, I don't remember, but we have, for example, width. I don't think that's it, but we have a width, we have a height, we have a font, we have CSS and all of that. So do you see here that specifically, we've got an object and then we're using a method or a property of it. And that's why I wanted to note that, because later we can write a value into those boxes. Um, you know, to like auto-populate an input field. I type my name, I don't want to have to retype my name or my email. We can use the dot val method to write a value into it. And don't do this, but it'll be something as easy as, you know, john at smith.com in quotes. So don't write this. But this is how we would write a value into an input field. It's what are we writing into it? In quotes, we just write it. So that writes or reads. Yes? I got a message that we did not have a class on Tuesday, is that correct? That is correct. Great, so where, where did all these lines come from? Because at line 42, I have totally something totally different than, I mean, I have up to date up to last week. And I was in class just two minutes after the class started. This uh, should be exactly what you have. This is where we ended up. 
Are you on the JavaScript, JavaScript tab? Oh, that's what I think. I'm on the other one. Yeah, yes. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, we just have to be careful. We're going to work with more than one file. So right now I'm in the JavaScript file. Yes. All right. So here, this is where we're at at the moment. Let's see what's next. We need to capture what was written here and then deal with it. So let's see here. OK, so what's coming up here is that we need to I'm going to start to set up set ourselves up to first let's confirm do these passwords match the person is typing in their uh, email and a couple of passwords and we want to confirm those passwords match so next line after our console logs we'll write conditional statement to uh, confirm the passwords match Here's a new concept, if you're newer to this, a conditional statement. This is going to check something on the condition of something, if something happens, if something is true or false. Uh, in real life, a conditional statement might be, um, am I hungry, yes or no? If yes, I am hungry, I'm going to go eat. If no, I'm not hungry, I, I won't eat. Maybe I have a little snack anyway. But uh, conditional statement on computer terms are similar to that. I'm going to check, is something true? Do this. If it's false, do that on the condition of something. And there are several conditional statements that we'll work with. Here's one of our first ones. If, and the syntax for this is set up like this. So for the moment, let's write the skeleton of this. The uh, basic syntax of it is in this format. If something, curly braces, or else something else, uh, and I'm just making a note here that this curly brace represents the end of my if-else statement, which is checking password confirmation. We're going to have several if-else statements. We're going to lose track of these curly braces. I highly recommend to put a little comment, what is the end of, like this. What is the end of this? Now I'm losing track of what that is. What's the end of that curly brace? Function. Function, yes. If we follow it back, if you click on it, it'll hi it should highlight and follow back. It'll go back to your function. So let's make a note that this is the end of our function sign up. Because these are going to be very easy to lose track of. When you're looking at hundreds of lines, unless I'm going to spend my time to follow it back, it's a good idea to put right here, end of the function sign up. So now at a glance, I don't have to go follow it back. I made myself a note that this is the end of that particular function. This is, of course, optional, arbitrary. You can make yourself notes however you want. For me, it just makes sense. This is end of this function. Just like I had up here, this is the end of this if-else statement. Um, let's be explicit. End of if-else statement. Checking password confirmation. All right, so in my case, back on line 40 and 41, I've got two variables that are holding the value of what they typed into there, uh, into those input boxes. So we just want to check, is the value of what's inside of this input box the same as the value that's inside of this input box? If these two match, OK, great. They've matched their password. Next step. If they didn't match the password, we have to tell them passwords don't match. So the condition will be right here. If one variable matches the other variable, great. Do what's in this first part. Or else they don't match, do what's in the second part. So basically for completeness, if 
the statement is true, do this part, or else it's false. So do this part. We can write one or 1,000 lines in between these curly braces where this if statement starts. If we find that this is true, do all of the lines from this curly brace to this, ignoring this. If what we're checking then turns out to be false, basically, okay, skip the stuff in the true block, and instead do the part in the false block, and then that if else statement ends and continue. Okay, so we're going to confirm those, those two values are the same. Actually, this would be a good point here also. Uh, let's do a little side digression briefly. Um, maybe uh, at this point would be a good uh, idea to think about turning on autocomplete. All of the code that we've been typing right now, we have to type it manually, and we'd have to type it, we've had to type it exactly perfectly every time. And we've seen that one wrong character, then it breaks. With autocomplete, it will help you to some degree to uh, complete the code for you uh, so that you don't make mistakes. Let's go check out where you turn on autocomplete in Notepad++. Uh, you should have this automatically if you get this at home, but I purposely turned it off here just for us to do it the long way, the difficult way, so you can learn. And then at home, you can do the shortcut. So if you go up to Settings menu, Preferences, and you will have to turn this on every time you come in because of our software protection. Settings, Preferences, We've got an item on the left, auto completion. So basically, in this first block here, you can turn on enable auto completion for each input. Yes. Uh, complete the function and words for me. Uh, do I want any hints to pop up to help me complete the code? Sure. Turn that on. Do you want it to automatically open and close my parentheses? Yeah, I forget that all the time. So sure, turn that on and the quotes, and your brackets, and your single quotes, and your curly braces, and your HTML tags, sure. You can turn it all on, and then that'll help you to, if you don't, if you keep forgetting to open and close these things. Now with the practice that we did together, of course, um, you know, hopefully you don't forget, but if it's necessary, here it is. And you can just close. All right, so what we're checking here is dollar $L. See, it's starting to pop up already. Do you mean dollar $L form sign up, L in email, whatever? I mean um, L in password sign up. So once you get these pop-ups happening, you can use your arrow keys and move up and down on the keyboard. You can double click the right item. Don't waste your time with the mouse, please. You want to, you want to press up and down with your arrow keys, and then you press tab not enter, to select your <coughs> shortcut, L in password sign up, tab, typed it for me without any misspellings, space, actually not a space yet, dot val, open close parentheses, space. Let's check the value of what's been typed into this input box, the password input box in the sign up screen. Let's make sure it's exactly the same as what they typed into the other input box. So that's going to be, um, let's confirm that it's that it's not different. So uh, exclamation point equals equals space dollar L. And this time I mean the in password confirm sign up. Yes. Say that one more time. Can't hear you. If it doesn't work, um, I'll check you in one moment. But as soon as you select it from the menu and click OK, it should pop up. If it doesn't, I'll. It might be that particular computer has an issue. You might want to restart Notepad. Uh, maybe that'll wake it up. But I'll check you one moment. So we've got L in password confirm dot val. OK, 
Okay, so conditional statement to confirm the password's match. We can make the note here saying, this means does not equal to exactly. If this does not equal this exactly, um, passwords don't match. If they do equal each other exactly, passwords do match. So what I'm checking for here, this first block, the question, the condition, is everything in the parentheses. I'm checking for, does this equal that exactly? Console log in the in the true block we're going we're giving ourselves some output in the console then we'll give it to the user of course but for ourselves we're saying passwords don't match Okay, so if these don't match up exactly, okay, that's true. This, they don't match up, so we do this first part. Uh, they do match, so we do the second part. Let's give ourselves some console output in the else block saying the opposite. Passwords do match. So again, if you've got the auto completion, you can start typing a little bit. It, might give you suggestions. You can press arrow keys to pick your correct code, and then you can press tab for it to type it for you. It won't do it all completely all the time. If I select log, you know, by the time log, L-O-G, I'm not going to waste my time L-O and then scrolling to find log. I'll just type log, but then um, parentheses, quotes. It doesn't do the semicolon at the end. You have to remember that one. Passwords. It's even going to autocomplete if it saw instances of a word you've typed before. It might say, "Well, you probably mean this." It doesn't. It doesn't. It does not only autocomplete valid JavaScript code, but I've typed the word password or passwords before, so it says you might mean you might mean this one again. Sure, I do mean that password, and then tab password does match. At this point, we can test it a little bit. Go ahead and save it and run it. Try to put in a password that does not match. Click Go and see if you get that message. Try to put a password that does match and see if you get the other message. So this is our code so far. Let's confirm that works. So let me test it on mine. I'm going to uh, run this in Firefox, F12. Actually, remember, if you run your JavaScript, it'll literally show you your JavaScript. You'll have to remember to run your HTML or refresh the, the program. Uh, sometimes the problem, however, with refreshing is depending on what history state it's in, you might not get what you, what you expect. So I just think it's safer to uh, rerun it um, from Notepad again instead of refreshing. It definitely should load it up 
in the correct state. Anyway, here, let's see. So I'm going to sign up. I'm going to type whatever here, a at a.com, password a, password a, join. Pops up here, passwords. Password does match. I can confirm it right there by the raw output. A is A. If I then hear clearly what I typed is different from here to here. Join. You saw here I type A, and here I type A, A, and here it says passwords don't match. That's what should happen right now. If it doesn't, we need to pause here, make sure that works before we go on. Pull my code back up again.
So moving on here, the, the idea is that uh, we've got this conditional statement on the condition of a, not pa of a not matching password, you do this. On the condition of a matching password, you do that. And we've just got some, uh, some console output for ourselves. Well, that doesn't help the user, because the user is not going to be looking at the developer's console. Um, we want pop-ups to, to appear to the user. We've set up pop-ups already before. Uh, let me just show you briefly. Remember, we've got the we've got these various divs with pop-ups. We've got a we've got a passwords don't match uh, in the HTML file. I want that to appear um, on screen. I want that to appear on screen as well as uh, this message for ourselves here. So next line after passwords don't match, uh, we need to set up these. We need to set up these uh, items. We need to set up the ability for those pop-ups to happen as objects. Let's see here. OK, so. Uh, in order for those pop-ups to happen, those pop-ups are in the HTML file. In the HTML file, um, we've got these divs. Well, this is the same issue in that we're in the JavaScript file, and I want to work with HTML nodes, so we need to make uh, JavaScript objects out of them to use them in the JavaScript. So let's back up to the part where we've got our main variables section. We created a variable to represent the form. We'll, we'll create a variable to represent those pop-ups. So next line after, at about line 27 or so, dollar $L. Um, that's our shorthand, our prefix for some um, jQuery-based element. And we'll call this pop error sign up mismatch this is coming from the HTML file where we've got those pop-ups those divs right there's the uh, there's the pop-up password passwords don't match with that unique ID so we're going to create a variable for it a little pop-up error sign up mismatch is equal to where mismatch no mismatch 
We could have it uh, spelled with a capital M, uh, but the word mismatch is not. Double S. Double S. Sure. There we go. Equal to dollar selector parentheses uh, semicolon quotes pound. Don't forget the pound because it's an ID. Pop error sign up. Usually what I misspell here all the time is sign up. I, I type it as sing up. Sign up mismatch. So create a variable uh, in JavaScript um, set to the, to the object in the HTML with that ID. Next line, the same thing, but then for the other pop-up, var dollar $l pop error sign up. The other one is exists. Equal to jQuery selector quotes pound pop error sign up exists. This is an example where tabbing this over might look nice and readable. We've got one more, the other pop up. The successful sign up. Our dollar L pop. Let's see what did we call it over here? We called it pop success sign up. Equal to jQuery selector quotes pound pop success sign up. And add the note uh, jQuery mobile or jQuery based variables or objects for our HTML nodes. So most of the time we'll be doing something like this. Like I said, we need to create a JavaScript representation of an HTML thing. OK, now that we've got these set up here, we'll be able to make those pop-ups happen via JavaScript. Uh, we've had screen changes, and we've had some pop-ups via HTML. Remember, we've obviously gone from PG Welcome to PG Sign Up by clicking a button that we made in the HTML, and it took us to from PG Welcome to PG Sign Up. When we were in the PG Welcome, remember we pressed the Options button and a pop-up happened, and that was all through HTML. Well, now sometimes we need to do things programmatically. We need to do things via code, via a, a reaction to something else. In this case, well, the reaction or the trigger is that your passwords don't match, therefore make the pop-up happen. Uh, so we've got the... Um, JavaScript representations of those things that then we will make up here. We'll go back to our conditional statement where we've got the uh, the error of passwords don't match. So back on our statement over here, we've got dollar L pop up dollar l pop error sign up mismatch that's the name of the object that we just created in javascript dot pop up method so again object dot method in order for this to work we have to first sort of activate it and then actually display it. So um, 
first initialize jQuery uh, mobile based pop-up then display it so let's copy that line and paste it exactly and then we will change it a little bit so we have to first say okay we've got an object that we created back on the other line it's going to behave like a pop-up next we're going to say okay now that we know it's going to behave like a pop-up let's actually pop it up and then here we can add some some parameters some options so quotes open we have the opposite what's the opposite of open close we can close a pop-up once we say well which pop-up are we talking about let's close it that'll come into play later but right here we're saying first prepare the thing to behave like a pop-up then actually open the pop-up in the parentheses comma you'll have curly braces quotes or double quotes transition space colon space flip well this is data dash transition equal to flip but in JavaScript syntax previously when we had buttons working uh, before and we animated from a screen to a screen it had data transition equals flip but we can't do it this way that way this time because this is now a reaction to an, uh, a conditional statement so we do it programmatically and notice the syntax Yes, it should be typed in exactly like this. So be careful here. We've got open and close parentheses. These have to do with the pop-up method. Then we've got one parameter, quotes, comma, curly braces. It's all lowercase, of course. Quotes. Actually, wait a minute. I'm making a mistake here because of the autocorrect. Autocomplete, it should be quotes here and then quotes here. Yes. It is technically a jQuery method. Ultimately, behind the scenes, it's JavaScript, but it's a jQuery method. J uh, jQuery mobile method. Yeah, that's why I right here. A jQuery mobile based pop up. Okay, so let's be careful here, everyone. Sorry about that. The auto completion threw me off. We want quotes around transition colon, and then quotes around that. So no quotes around the colon, it's quotes around transition, space, colon, space, quotes. Now this is in JSON format, which we will cover later, but it's a value and a key, and it's gotta be in that way. Um, at this point, we can test it. Let's pause here and test this. Go ahead and save, and, save it and run it. Um, you should you should try to make your passwords not match and you should get this pop-up that happens let me just confirm on mine that it's working and then we'll do a little help here let me just check mine is working first so if I go to sign up a at a.com this should only pop up when they don't match so I'll type password a and password BB join pop-up passwords don't match then I can click it or outside and then it closes so that's a flip transition happening we have the other ones that could also work slide up turn flow those other ones we've used before so not only are we getting output in the console we get it on screen because we've got two things that div that we made last week and then actually showing it here so does that work anyone need a little help with that
Okay, so what we've got then is the passwords match or they don't match. That's the idea with this if else. Um, do you see here that when you uh, are typing in your, your password and if they don't match it pops up and wouldn't it be nice for then it to help me? Well, uh, clearly here this does not match that. But if I was typing them at the exact same length, I cannot tell what I typed wrong. Oftentimes what happens here is these boxes kind of clear themselves out, right? So let's clear these boxes to help the person. You mistyped something. Try it again. So back to the code here. Ladies. So uh, pop-up here, after the pop-up, we're going to say, also, let's clear those boxes. Uh, those boxes are dollar $L uh, in um, password sign up dot val and also dollar L in password confirm uh, sign up dot val. Well, this is reading the values. We've done that. Now we want to do the opposite, which is to write the values. What we're going to do is quote and quote. Nothing in between the quotes. Just a couple of opening and closing quotes, because then that basically cleans out those boxes. If you put a space in, it kind of works, but don't put a space, because uh, a space is technically not nothing. A space still takes up one uh, one byte of memory. A space is character code number 32. It is something. It's just invisible. So don't put a space between those quotes. Just open quote, end quote. The whole point of that is then now uh, we put in, the person puts the wrong password in. The pop up happens to say uh, wrong password. And then those boxes clean themselves out so that they can type the correct passwords or the matching passwords in. So. A good spot for a note there. Um, we'll say reset those boxes to empty empty input fields. All right, so testing this, um, you should see that result in that you're typing the um, the wrong passwords. You get the pop-up that says wrong password, and those boxes should clean themselves out. So I get the output. They don't match. I get the pop-up, they don't match. And those two boxes clean themselves up because a person is never going to figure out, how did I mistype it? Let me fix it. They can't see it to, mis uh, to correct what they mistyped. So right here I'll type cat, and here I'll type dog. You don't know what I typed because it's invisible, but it's three characters, but I don't know what I typed. doesn't matter because then when I try to join, it'll say passwords don't match, and they'll clean themselves out. Okay, let's deal with the part about, um, okay, the passwords do match. Uh, I typed in AAA at the beginning, and then I also typed AAA. So that means they type their password, it matches, uh, their email matches, and so let's then create an actual user. So going now to our else uh, portion. What we're going to have, what we're going to do here is, okay, uh, we've seen several times um, that the uppercase and the lowercase matters. Um, the problem here is a person 
technically, if they type their email with a capital letter, and, and you create an account with their email with a capital letter, and then they try to sign in, and they don't use a capital letter, technically it'll say this, this account doesn't exist. Capital email versus non-capital email, technically it's different. So what we're going to do is we're going to simply uh, store uh, the, their email uh, as one case. No matter how they typed it, we're going to store it as all uppercase or all lowercase so that there's no problem of mismatching what did they type. It's going to be the same both ways. So making a note here, this is inside of our, our else uh, block. This is the part that they do match. So we will say create temporary copies of the email turned to uppercase. So we're going to create a variable. We're going to create a variable container, a variable object uh, to store their password. We'll call this TMP, no dollar symbol. I'll explain why in a moment. Val in email sign up equal to. So we're going to create a variable that will be the temporary value of the input field email from the sign up screen. We will set its, uh, its contents to $L in email uh, sign up. Dot val. Okay, so here we're saying, uh, let's get the value of what's in this box. Let's store it in this temporary variable. But also, dot to uppercase, capital U, capital C, uppercase, parentheses, semicolon. Alright, so we've got an input field, let's get its value, let's turn it uppercase, let's store that in this variable. So however they type their email address with mixed uppercase and lowercase, force it all to uppercase. The point of that is that uh, it doesn't really matter internally uppercase and lowercase, uh, how they typed it, uh, but it matters if we're going to retrieve it because uppercase and lowercase is different. So just force it all to uppercase. Uh, guess what? There's also an opposite of to uppercase. What do you think it is? To lowercase. To lowercase. So if instead you wanted it to be everything stored as lowercase, then it's lowercase, like that. Whatever, however they typed it in mixed cases and such, I'm forcing it down to lowercase. I'm going to keep it as uppercase. Now regarding passwords, when we're dealing with a, um, with, a, with a website or an app that has various user accounts and all of that, we want, of course, um, you know, perfect security to store their, uh, their passwords and all of that. Um, at the moment here, we're not going to store passwords in a very complex way. We're not going to encrypt it and create hash tables and all of that. Um, that'll be a little bit for later. We don't need this advanced um, encryption and storage at the moment for this to work. We can come back to it. So the passwords will be stored internally as plain text. They're going to be stored inside of the app. You'd have to reverse engineer the app. They're not going to be stored in like any sort of like uh, readable file that you can easily open in Notepad. They're going to be buried uh, inside of the device. So we need to do the same thing for uh, the password. Var, next line var, temp val in password sign up. 
Now we're only going to create a temporary um, uh, password uh, for one of them, only the first sign up, not the, not the confirm. We don't need the confirm because by the time we're in this else block, we've confirmed those passwords are the same. We don't need to store them both. They're the same. That's a waste of effort. We only need to confirm or conform one of them to uppercase, not both of them. They're both the same if we've gotten to this part of the code. So then we do the exact same thing we had up here. Whatever object dot val dot to uppercase. And the whatever object is the one up here. Of dollar L in password sign up. I want the value of that, and I want that to turn to uppercase. Okay, so this is going to take uh, whatever their email was, turn it all uppercase, turn it all lowercase. You can confirm this is a little console output. Console log, we'll say uh, temporary email is. And then console log. Temporary password is It's a very good idea to uh, test yourself as you work on the code in theory, okay, this seems to work. I, I typed all val. It's all correct. You know, I followed the instructor. I practiced. It's all correct. Let me move on. Well, here I made a mistake on purpose, and I might not catch it unless I do a little testing as I go. I'm going to get an error here. Not this. This doesn't matter, of course, because it's in quotes. It's going to literally say password misspelled, but that doesn't matter. It's just a message. This matters over here. This is all correct. And then over here I made a mistake. Two uppercase and two uppercase. That's going to be a mistake. It doesn't highlight or anything like that, but as I test it here, it'll say temporary email password is undefined. Because it's like, what is two uppercase? I don't know what two uppercase is. I know what two uppercase is, but I don't know what two uppercase is. Right? The misspelling right there. Capital C. So save it and run it. Uh, take a quick look when you put your passwords that do match. Uh, it should show your email and your password in all capital letters. If there's any uh, undefined and such, well, go back to the line that it's telling you. Maybe take a double look, a double check at your spelling. But at this point, it should show capitalized um, email and password. Let me confirm on mine. And load it up in the browser again. I'm going to go to sign up, password AAA, password AAA. Join. OK, so passwords don't match. That's working good. AAA, AAA, join. Over here, you saw that I did type a.a.com and then AAA. And then over here it says, okay, now we've made it to uppercase, capital A, capital A.com. Password is capital AAA.
Okay, next line over here, we're going to say um, storing user accounts. Again, at this point, we're not going to get very complex. Uh, we're, not, we're eventually going to use a database, but it's a little too early for that. We're going to store simple bits of data, username and password. Again, they're not going to be encrypted and such. Um, we're going to deal with that a little bit later. Uh, these are going to be stored inside of the, at the moment, inside of the browser. Later on, uh, they're going to be stored uh, in the device, uh, in the actual app in the device. But we're sort of going to use the concept of cookies. Uh, so what's a cookie? Anyone know what a cookie is based on the web? Not quite a database, sort of, but yes. What? Anyone else? It's a pre-existing visited location. It's the data of a pre-existing visiting location. Yeah. So if I go to a website, it's going to save data uh, that I've visited that before. It's going to be uh, data uh, in a database, so to speak. So a cookie is data, simple data that we can store. Um, we have something like that that we will use here, and this is called using JavaScripts local storage object so JavaScript uh, and the latest versions of HTML and the latest browsers they can let us save a, uh, a, a simple bit of data uh, in a local storage object. I'm probably going to go back and forth by calling it a local storage object or a local storage cookie. The way it works is like this. Uh, we write local storage, only capital S, local is lowercase, local storage, dot set item, capital, uh, capital I but not capital S, parentheses. So this looks the same as what we've been doing with other JavaScript so far. Object, method, object, method. There's a local storage object. We're going to use a method. We have set item. We have get item. We have delete item. We can look up other ones later. What we have here, let's set an item. Let's set a cookie. Let's set a little bit of data into the, into the, uh, into the program's memory. This is permanent memory. I have permanent in quotes because it's not completely permanent. Everything else that we're working with, like variables, they only exist in as long as the program is running. Um, I've got data being manipulated in variables, and it exists as long as uh, the program is running, as long as it's in memory. Uh, local storage is more permanent. If I uh, set an item, if I create a local storage object, it'll stay there once I close the browser and I restart the browser. Um, it's not completely permanent in terms of I can go into my web browser and clear cookies. I can delete the web browser. I can reinstall the web browser. Eventually, when we put this into an app, yes, it'll remember the data as long as you've got the app installed. If you uninstall the app and reinstall the app, then it's gone. We'll deal with that um, issue when we get to that later. But local storage is more permanent memory. This is the most modern way to create cookies. Cookies has been around for you know, 15, 20 years, whatever. This method is probably like five to seven years, so it's a much more modern method. It's a bit of a better method because it stores more data than the classic cookie. Classic cookie would store like five kilobytes of data. This can do like five megabytes, you know, 10,000 times bigger, whatever the number is. It stores in the browser. It stores in the browser. It stores in the browser, and when this becomes a real app, it'll store itself in the app file itself. And it's not encrypted, but it's in the app itself, which will be encrypted. So it's not, you know, it's it's not, you know, Fort Knox. You can 
break the app and see the data, but we, we'll worry about that a little later. The way this works is um, works by um, uh, using a key or name and value pair. So the cookie needs a name and then a value in the cookie. So inside of set item in quotes, we're going to say, what's the name of our cookie? Let's say username. We're going to store a cookie called username. And then the value of the username, comma, temp val in email sign up. We're going to use usernames. Uh, we're going to use emails as the username. That's a very common practice. So into our local storage memory area, we're going to set an item. The item is called username, comma. The value is the person's email. No quotes here, because we're storing what's inside of the variable not literally the name of the variable. If we had put quotes here, it would literally set the username to the word temp val in email sign up. No, we don't want that. We want what's in the variable, so no quotes. To test how this works, let's go ahead and save it and run it in the browser. And then in the browser, depending on which browser we're in, we can see what that data is. For the moment, let's all save it and test it in Chrome, so I can show you where to check your local storage cookies. And then I'll show you where to test it, or how to check it, in Firefox. But save it and run it. Confirm you have no errors. Uh, uh, create, try to create an account with an email and a password that matches. And then I'll show you where this is being stored in just a moment. So let me confirm mine works. I'm going to look at it in Chrome first, then I'll show you how to look at it in Firefox. And so I'm going to sign up. I'm going to create an account, a at a.com, password a, confirm a, join. OK, so this is all looking good as I expected it. Uh, a is A, uppercase. Okay, so in Chrome, to see where this is getting stored at, um, we've got at the top here these various tabs. We've been in the console tab. Let's go over to the application tab. If you don't see it, maybe you know it's closed like that, so you want to click the double arrow. We want to go to application. application tab. So here's where all your cookies are getting stored when you browse on the web. When we talk about more powerful databases, they will be right here. Session storage, local storage. If you open local storage, click the triangle there. This particular file, open that, it says that there is a username cookie stored and it has a value of A at A. thing stored. So username has been set to a at a.com. If I keep playing with this, I'll do b at b.com, password b, confirm b, join. Um, I click join. Well, we've done set item again, and I've set the username to be what was typed there, and then it should update. If it doesn't update, sometimes you have to press this little refresh. You might even have to refresh the browser. You might have to open and close the browser. Sometimes it's finicky. But here I'm seeing that I'm storing another value. So if I was doing this for real, victor at victor.com with my real password, 
I have a very I have a very powerful password. But uh, here it's gonna store. If you want to see how this looks in Firefox, if Firefox is the browser you want to use, let me show you in Firefox where to see this. Uh, so if you run this in Firefox, F12, I'm going to sign up. So I've signed, uh, I've signed up uh, in Firefox. You should see a tab called storage. They're calling it storage instead of application. Clicking there, you get a different looking kind of screen. Here's our cookies, here's our databases, index DB, here's our local storage. If I open that, this particular file shows this. I've got a key and a value. I've got a cookie named username, and then I've got a value of my email. Local storage is like an alternative to cookies, yes. So that's what I see. People still use cookies. Um, I would recommend to use local storage because it is, it is a more modern specification to do this. Um, Again, it's it's give you gives you more space. I have a question. So when people clear the cookies, when you clear the cookies, it will also clear this. Um, I think somewhere when you select clear cookies, it asks you do you want to clear cookies and local storage and cache and memory and all of that. So if you tell it to clear everything, yes, it will clear everything. So that's what I was saying earlier, that they're quote unquote permanent. However, if you clear out your cache and cookies and such, well, then you've chosen to delete it, so it does delete. Mm -hmm. And Firefox also, if you're interested, you can click on it and it'll show further here. Well, there's your username and it's there's the value and it's part of one, it's, uh, it has it, it has two items in this array, the zero with and the first and so forth. Uh, so this is this is local storage. Let's do one more thing here, then we'll take a break uh, regarding local storage. Uh, so uh, go to your browser, and we can search. Let's search for this MDN local storage. I want to make you aware of a great website that should help in the class. MDN, it's the Mozilla Developer Network. It's a great website that is like the manual for HTML and JavaScript and CSS. It comes from Mozilla, the people behind Firefox. Firefox is one of the oldest browsers um, that is still around. Um, uh, back in the day, does anyone remember using Netscape, Netscape Navigator and such? Uh, Netscape, a very early browser uh, that was dominant in the 90s. They eventually morphed into Mozilla Firefox, basically, long story short. So they're still around. And actually, um, the original team that worked on the original Netscape were the ones that first invented JavaScript. So that, like the official docu documentation of JavaScript is back at their developer.mozilla.org website. So all of the official documentation, tutorials and such are there. I, I want to perhaps read a little bit more on how does, local, uh, how does local storage work. So they got a couple of articles here it looks like. I'll just go to the first one. Uh, window, <coughs> technically window.local storage, but local storage works fine. So if I open that first link. The read-only local storage property allows you to access a storage object for the document's origin. The stored data is saved across browser sessions. So the data is persistent. You, uh, you, I can close completely uh, my, pro my project and open it up again, and the data will still be there. 
So if I open it again, I haven't typed anything. I go to local storage, uh, and it will it will be there. Now, it is it is protected in a, in the sense of if I create data, if I do set item in uh, Firefox, that cannot be opened in Chrome and vice versa. That's a security feature that one browser cannot open the cookie, the local storage, of another browser. Uh, that'll be more important a little later. Local storage is similar to session, except that while data is stored, it is no expiration time. So how does it work? There's an example. What what are values? Examples here. This is what we just did here. Local storage dot set item. You've got a cookie named my cat, and then a value of Tom. Uh, you can say, okay, let's let's go pull the data out of local storage. Create a variable, call it cat, local storage dot get item. Get me the data inside of the cookie called my cat and store it into a variable called cat. Let's delete the data from local storage. Okay, local storage dot remove item, which item? The one with that name. And it removes it. And so you can read that article on your own for fun. Uh, and it's compatible in all the browsers and such. And you can go see examples. So this, uh, this site here of MDN, Mozilla Developer Network, I, I recommend you add it to your notes. I, I think I have it in the syllabus. But if not, um, developer.mozilla.org. That's where you want to go to further uh, learn uh, JavaScript and HTML and CSS, all straight from like one of the big names in the world of web development. So you can search documentations, keep up to date, become a super hacker. So let's take uh, our first break. Uh, it's 7.17. Let's take a break until 7.27, and then we'll be back. I'll be there one moment.